It is time for This Week in Location-Based Marketing, episode number 52. Hit it. It's so sad. You know, we'll, once, we'll get a budget for this stuff. <laughs> That's groovy. We don't have to listen to the whole song. I'm going to blow. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three. There we go. Action. All right. Episode number 52, Asif. Buddy, congratulations. A whole year. I can't believe it. Um, We're here. A whole year. And you know what? We only worked on that for 15 minutes. There you go. That intro. My goodness, uh, 52 episodes. And this isn't just about like 52 episodes. This is 52 consecutive episodes that we've done here at This Week in Location-Based Marketing. It's something that we should be very proud of. I can't believe it. And um, yeah, I'm impressed. What can I say? Yeah, no, it's it's pretty awesome. And, uh, you know, we, we're, uh, we're getting tons of good feedback. And uh, I expect we'll be doing another 52. So... Well, for those of you who don't know who we are, and you're wondering what it's, what this is all about, we started on this last October, actually. So, uh, yeah, end of last October. Mm-hmm. And uh, we are now one year into this, 52 weeks into this. And uh, my name is Rob Woodbridge from Untether.tv, where I have been for the last 52 weeks. And I think that's a record. Not only did I have we done more uh, podcasts in a row than I ever thought possible, I've, I've been doing the same thing for longer than I ever thought possible as well. It's it's uh, it's unbelievable. And with me as always from uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, Asif Khan from the Location Based Marketing Association. So yeah, I'm still flabbergasted. Fifty two. It's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. I even got the shirt on today. See, I know. There you go. I seem yeah. to be uh, didn't get didn't get in the mail. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, you know, for 52 consecutive weeks, 52 episodes, we've been bringing you the best of the best of the best of the things that you should know about what's going on in the location-based marketing world, what's going on uh, in the mobile world. We've been doing that for you, and this is no different. We're not taking this one off. You know, it just might seem like it. You know, it started a little week. Uh, that was our birthday celebration. Uh, but we've got lots of stuff for you on store today. Uh, and, and this, I mean, the, the, the industry doesn't stop. It's not celebrating, so we should just continue on down this way. I mean, Asif and I will go and raise a glass when we get together again, when we actually can meet, you know, Absolutely. connect each other. It's weird that you were actually in, in my town this week, and we still couldn't get together. So, anyhow. Toronto's a big city. It's a big city. Yeah. And for, you know, a, a small city guy like me, tough, tough to do that. But we, we will do this, because I think the last time we saw each other, we had to be in New York or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, this week, we've got uh, some uh, some weird name companies. I'll say that right now. A company called yeah. Souk, a company called Ortsbo and Kowango, and uh, something with Gene Simmons, a little bit of Yowza, a little bit of Scavenger. Brand new feature. We're gonna we're gonna come to that after the yeah. uh, the events, and we got some funding news, some IPO news, and of course our resource of the week. Right, all all in episode number fifty two. We're gonna jam through this because special feature is gonna be about ten minutes. So let's get going, Asif. Unless you have something to say about uh, what's going on here, 52 episodes, or, or are no, we past that? No, now? let's get right into it. Plenty, plenty to cover. So we'll, Fair enough. Let's make it happen. All right. The first funny uh, name, but it's an interesting company, and it's from a place called Dubai, Souk. Souk.com. Souk, yeah. So I uh, saw this story this week. Uh, really interesting company. Um, they're actually uh, apparently Souk, so it's S-O-U-Q. Right. Uh, dot com. Um, they're the largest e-commerce marketplace in Egypt and, and the uh, the Arab uh, world, and um, you know they so they've done a bunch of stuff with their online uh, portal, their e-marketplace. But uh, one of the things that I found kind of interesting is they launched a a mobile app, an iPhone uh, app that uh, is location based. And Souk's primary market that they serve is is kind of online classifieds around you know uh, housing as well as automotive. Uh, and they've taken that uh, into the location-based arena so that while you're out and about, um, you know, looking at different communities, you can basically pull up property listings and uh, find apartments around you and, um, you know, all this kind of uh, 
geolocal relevant information, you know, through an iPhone app, um, you know, whether that be automotive data or housing uh, data, uh, it's all brought to you based on where you are. So n nothing crazy, unique or innovative about it. Um, but interesting that, you know, uh, you know, a lot of us might think this is only happening in North America or only in Europe. Um, but uh, it's not, it's happening everywhere and, um, and it's happening in the Middle East too. So uh, r really interesting stuff. Yeah, they're calling this the first location-based classifieds app in the region, which is, uh, I, you know, I, I always thought that, uh, that Dubai and the Arab world were dominant in the BlackBerry side. So uh, this, yeah. I think this is, uh, this, this is good. Um, and uh, really, this is, this is not revolutionary, but if they're the first in, in Dubai in that region, then I think that this is something that sh we should be highlighting here. So Souk, and this is S-O-U-Q dot com. If you actually happen to be in, uh, in, in the Middle East, um, hang out, find your spot, find your next uh, rental or your next property, your next car with the Souk dot com app. Yeah. All right. I like that. Um... Flipping right over to our good friends, uh, I, you know what, I, I'll be the first to say, listen, you know what, I, I interviewed Greg Grunberg, who okay. is the uh, the figurehead uh, behind this company, Yowza, at getyowza.com. Um, mm -hmm. I, I interviewed, he was one of my very first interviews, and uh, Greg Grunberg, if you don't know who this guy is, he's an actor, right, he's an actor, he was the, yep. uh, he was Matt Parkman in Heroes. That's uh, and he was also he's been on a bunch of things. He's been in every J.J. Abrams uh, TV show. Uh, I think he was in Alias. He was in Felicity. Anyways, yes. I didn't know who he was. I did my research on him, and uh, I didn't think he'd show up for the interview. Uh, and guess what? He did. And it's up there on Tether TV. It was a really funny interview. I became a fan right then and there of him and the product itself because it was interesting to me how in a very short period of time he could get fifteen thousand vendors. Right. And that's how he. You know, he used his celebrity to to do that, and plus, it's a good product. If, but, if we only all had such uh, uh, celebrity, eh? we could only all kiss Alyssa Milano. You know what I'm saying? Uh, oh. Yeah, Who's well, the boss? yeah. Well, <laughs> so yeah, no, we're not I'm, ourselves, Rob. I know exactly. Well, yeah. Anyways, well, yeah, I was, I've always been a fan of this, and and I uh, became a fan of uh, of Greg as a result of that. And uh, but now they're out there doing some stuff. We don't hear much from Yowza, but they are uh, uh, plodding along and and growing at, at a considerable rate. And uh, this time they've they've created a great relationship with my gym. Yeah, and, and so like a lot of companies uh, that have been around for a while, Yowza being one of those that's in the kind of mobile couponing world. Uh, a lot of them have kind of rebranded themselves as location-based mobile couponing companies yeah. to kind of you know uh, go with this whole theme of everything is location-based now. Um, and so they partner with a company called MyGym, and MyGym is um, a children's fitness uh, company. And uh, so basically, it's a company that's focused on you know getting people, getting young people to get out there, be more active, fight obesity, uh, all these kinds of things. And so what they've done is is so MyGym. Um, and the have partnered up and basically participating gyms uh, who support the MyGym program can uh, push offers and content through the, uh, through the Yaza, uh mobile app. And so they've got this thing where basically $30 off a new membership, 15% uh, savings on classes, you know, a bunch of different specials that are uh, available uh, through the system. And, um, you know, I think it's kind of interesting only because... You know, we don't hear a lot about, um, you know, we hear a lot from Groupon and some of these other guys about uh, Living Social, about manicures and pedicures and massages. Well, you know, that, that's great, but, you know, obesity is a big problem and, and you know, using, leveraging location-based services uh, and partnering with companies that are, you know, fighting this, this, this challenge, I, you know, I like it. I, th I think it's a good fit. Well, I, I, yeah, I do, I do as well. I mean, I think that... Uh, it any, anything that has to do with a, a good cause and, and actually allowing parents to get their kids physically active this way, I think a yeah. great, great combination. And, um, and so th this is something that I expect. Uh, you know, I, I would expect to see this across all gyms going forward, certainly. Not a lot of gyms, I think, have, have, uh, have leveraged location um, in their marketing or in their discounting. Uh, it's right. the funniest thing. I, I pull up in front of my gym. Uh, it's it's the greatest thing ever. It's it's a fail, right? And this is where location based marketing and and um, basically geofencing something, like like what uh, what Yaz is doing with my gym, 
uh, would work very well because I love this. When you walk up to the gym, it's like big ornate entrance, and then um, it's got right next to it, it's got like join for free, or uh, you know, it's got a three percent or a fifteen percent discount as you're walking the door, and and you have to be in front of the door to see it. Like that doesn't make any sense anymore. So I, well, I like and what the best part with a lot of these gyms is is like you come out the door after your workout and right 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 next door, right across the street is Fat Burger. Or yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's it. So, well, but, well, in my gym, uh, yeah, I think you can smoke in my gym still. Okay, good. Yeah, it's one of those. It's like uh, you know, all the meatheads are down there, and and me, and, and they're all they're all smoking. Um, nice. Yeah. So Yao's well, in my gym. Don't smoke. Yeah, don't smoke. Anyways, good good partnership. Uh, you know, hope to see more from Yaza. Um, you know, it'd be great to get uh, get these guys back on the show, maybe, and uh, you know, hear what they have to say directly. So let's 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 look into that. Yeah, well, certainly uh, I can uh, I can reach out to to Greg, and he he won't respond, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm no celebrity. Our, our third story. Uh, this is this is interesting. So I got I got to ask you. Um, you know, I I don't pick my um, my uh, dryer sheets, my bounce sheets, or whatever you want to call them, uh, very well, right? I look at the lowest price and I say, okay, listen, that's what I'm going to buy, and it's usually like a no name product yep. that stinks, and I get in a lot of trouble when I bring that back. But this is Downy Unstoppables, brand new product, working with our good friend Seth Prebatch and his company Scavenger to do a scavenger hunt in Vegas for this product launch. Yeah. Um, so here, here's my initial thought on this. Uh, first of all, I love Scavenger. You know, we, we talk about how much we love Seth, how much we love Scavenger. Um, so nothing bad to say about them or the or the product. Um, what I don't quite get about this is, um, you know, Downey launching, you know, P and G Downey launching a new product in Vegas, and and they're trying to say this is, you know, this is about a sensory experience, and Vegas is the ultimate sensory experience place. It sounds to me like you know this thing launches on December the third. This this uh, this this um, campaign, which we'll talk about in a second. It sounds to me like it's the end of the year. They got a bunch of budget to blow, and everybody wants to go to Vegas on the marketing team over at PNG. Um, that you know, that's my take on this personally. But anyways, um, let's explain what it is. So, sure. And then you can make your judgment, which will yeah, be the same as yeah, ours. You can make your judgment. Uh, so it's called Downey Unstoppables. Uh, it's a new product. Um, basically, you know, it's scent beads um, is what they call them, and you can put this in the wash. Makes your clothes smell nice. Same as the you know the old sheets and and everything else. But now we're into beads. Yes. Um, anyhow, um, the thought <laughs> process is is they're hiding stuff all over uh, Las Vegas. Uh, December the third. You use your mobile phone with the scavenger app. You go around. You find these things. You take pictures. You complete tasks. Typical scavenger. Uh, program, you know, you collect points and you win prizes. Um, and there is a big prize here, like the winning team. And, and so there, uh, you can sign up, and, and, and it's kind of like an amazing race. You're running around the city, and you in your in teams. Um, and so they're taking uh, entries right now for this. I think they said something like uh, 750 teams. Uh, the first 750 teams that apply, yes, will be chosen to participate. Um, and you can sign up online. Uh, they also have a Facebook ver uh, uh, page for this. You can also play online. But the winning team gets twenty grand um, in cash that they can split with their team. The second place team gets to stay at the Bellagio. So um, third place you know, team, you're fired. Yeah, I had to do that. Right? <laughs> um, again, so nothing really innovative or, or you know unique about this. Um, it's just I think it's a little bit crazy for me. Like P and G, you know. You know, <laughs> I freshener, freshener here. Like you know, we're talking about freshening our clothes, yeah, and know. we're talking about you know running around Las Vegas and smelling stuff. Um, I don't know. It's very uh, flowery the language it, around this, but that's just me. Well, so uh, you know, I, I love the fact that they that they're that they're doing this, and and to sign up if you happen to be in Vegas that week, it's it's downyunstoppableshunt dot com, and you can sign up there, and. Um, now, here's the thing that that uh, missed opportunity. So the the big thing here, I think, is that they wanted to set this world record, right, for uh, the largest uh, scavenger hunt. Yes. Right. Yeah, Guinness record. Yeah. Guinness, Guinness record, and and uh, so they limited it to 750 teams, which I I don't understand. Um, and and the second thing is uh, maybe it's a safety thing, maybe it's an insurance thing. Why? Like Vegas is one spot. The beauty of mobile is that you can tag a bunch of locations around the world. And make this a truly like or North America or the U.S. 
make this a, a truly uh, immersive and grand experience across the country. Instead, you pick Vegas. So you could have done it so that you picked 10 locations in 10 major cities and done this on a national campaign. Yeah, but Rob, of, Rob, you didn't hear me at the beginning. Yeah. The marketing team at P&G wants, wants to, to go, go to Vegas. Vegas. That, Must the, be cold in Chicago or something like that right about now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, but that just a missed opportunity, right? Mobile. Here's this great mobile opportunity. You're spending a ton of cash because you're advertising on Facebook and radio and and Twitter and all that kind of stuff, and you're spending twenty thousand dollars for the winner and a night in the Bellagio, and you're doing all this press and all this advertising for this new product launch, and you're limiting it to seven hundred fifty teams in Vegas. Just it's fail for me. Fail, fail, fail. I love Scavenger. I can understand where they get involved. And in I love PNG, and they got great products. I just don't. I'm just not getting this fit with this Vegas scavenger hunt. It doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. It does. It does not. The funniest thing was um, was I mean you got to just but, but Google hey, this. Hey, if you're listening from PNG, Rob and I are cheap. Yes. Send us some scent beads. We'll try them out, and we'll uh, you know we'll push them on the show. Hey. Exactly. Send us to Vegas. We'll cover it. Yeah. There you go. We'll, here's an idea. Rob and I will be a team. <laughs> We just in we, Vegas. We'll run around and we'll do the scavenger hunt. I just think because our um, I, I, it just takes a little bit of time to hitchhike there. That's all. So if you can fly us there, we'll get there sometime this year before Christmas. Done. So scavenger uh, reaching out again. Big brands. Like one of the big things that the big story here, I think, is the fact that uh, scavenger, uh, you know, latching onto another big brand or another big brand latching onto scavenger, which I think is uh, kind of fuels the fire and the flames around scavenger. At some point, has to something has to happen with that company. It's getting too big, working with too many big brands to uh, to not kind of draw attention to itself from the big guys, like Facebook or something, somewhere. Somewhere. P and G, Scavenger, Vegas, Downey Unstoppables, World Guinness Book of World Record for largest scavenger hunt, digital scavenger hunt, twenty grand up for grabs. That's the third story. Fourth story. This this is great. Like I think that this might this might be the story that we cover here. This might be the story of the week around uh, the uh, Weatherspoon pubs, uh, their augmented reality. Maybe that's lame, but their their couponing initiative that's driving uh, students to their bars. This is pretty cool. It, this is pretty cool. Um, so so this is a British pub chain uh, called Weatherspoon um, that has a bunch of pubs. They partner with Bacardi, um, and they ran uh, basically a campaign, as Rob indicated, you know, about pushing, you know, on, you know, putting up posters and signage all over university campuses with uh, symbols on them. And if you had the mobile app, um, basically you could you could scan these things and you could see augmented reality um, offers and, and incentives to you know drive traffic to these pubs. And this is a campaign that's uh, completed. And, and the you know I was looking at some of the numbers on this thing. It's staggering. So they ran this uh, in September. Um, 280 pub locations. 9,000 people downloaded the uh, mobile app. 34,000 coupon downloads. And a redemption rate of 40% in, in six weeks that this thing was running. Uh, pretty crazy. Um, and, and you know, it was, it was really interesting. So they had, you know, ha they had this digital content, on, as I said, on symbols. You know, they were on posters. They were on beer mats. They were on T-shirts. They were on, all, you know, things that, you know, students interact with when you're at university. I mean, um, you know, uh, you know whether we like it or not, people are drinking. And, uh, you know, why, why not uh, why not get, it, get behind that and, uh, you know, um, you know, try and leverage some of this new technology to uh, to drive people to to your to your locations. It makes sense. Uh, it's a good fit. And then when they're done, when they're done drinking and they've got the beer guts, then you know, hook up with my gym and uh, <laughs> go over there. Get there a discount go. from from Yowza, and and then uh, and yeah, then yeah, absolutely. Get on Yowza and get a discount from my gym. So. Well, one of one of the things that was interesting about this was that you could um, there there was a feature that you could tag uh, yourself and items inside of the bar or around uh, yes. the bar and. Uh, when people found those things all through the app, when people found those things, they too got a discount. So it kind of propagated this, this kind of this yeah, couponing. Yeah, kind of had a social magnification yeah. element. Yeah. So I, I like this forty percent redemption rate. So nine thousand apps downloaded in six weeks. In the six in the six weeks this went, forty percent redemption rate. Like that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty remarkable uh, redemption rate for this. Now the question would be, 
um, are they at a new level of engagement with those customers? So did they get the 40% in redemption? Was it all the same guys that usually go to the to this bar? Or did they have some, right. some other new revenue added onto it? So was their new normal a little bit higher as a result of this? And th those are the numbers that nobody ever talks about, which is, uh, right. I want to know. Tell me, did this boost revenue or are you back to normal? Or did this cost you in the long run? Because I think that's the difference between a good and a terrible engagement in mobile, especially location-based and couponing. So dangerous. But 40% redemption rate? Pretty darn good. Not so bad. The, the yeah. uh, augmented reality piece on the posters, not so sure that it mattered that I could see a spinning logo or anything like that. But uh, you know what? Maybe a little bit over the overboard, a little bit of uh, you know, candy. You, you don't know unless you try, right? So. Yeah, so Bacardi uh, teaming up with Weatherspoon uh, Pubs, and uh, they were giving away a lot of coupons. Thirty-four thousand coupons, forty percent redemption rate. I like it. All right, I can't even I can't even pronounce these guys. All I know is that Gene, Sim Gene Simmons, or fifth story, or Gene Simmons, Gene Simmons was involved with this somehow at the MMAs. He got up on stage with the CEO of Ortsbo and uh, talked about Kowango, and I'm not making any of that up. No. Um, yeah. So the MMA uh, had uh, had an event uh, just this past week uh, in LA, um, and uh, one of one of the uh, the presentations, one of the keynote speeches, was with uh, David uh, Lukacs, who's the CEO of uh, Ortsbo and uh, Rockstar Gene, Sim Gene Simmons. So a rock star uh, and Gene, internet. Gene, they, wait, wait. They described him as a rock star. Um, no, that was actually the last thing. International businessman, actor, inventor. And acclaimed frontman from the rock band Kiss. Yeah, that's the last piece. Yeah, international businessman. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Anyway, so Gene Simmons, we all know him. Yeah. So he he's apparently Gene is uh, I guess on the board. He's the spokes uh, spokesperson for uh, Ortsbo dot uh, com, uh, which is a um, experiential language uh, platform company. And and so the, the interesting thing about this, and I really really like this pro product. The product's called Kowango, and what what it what it tries to get after is is when we're out and about using these apps. And and I think back when I was reading this, you know, you think you think back to, you know, the all the group uh, messaging and group text, and you know, all those all those apps that we've talked about over the last year, you know, when about finding people who are around you. Well, you know, the reality is is that. All those apps that we've talked about are limited to finding people around you who happen to speak your language. Um, but there's probably a lot of other people around you that have common interests, uh, especially in metropolitan places like Toronto and New York and um, you know Seattle and LA and, and places like that where there's just so many different cultures. Um, and, and and this just makes sense. So this what this is is the ability to connect with people regardless of language, um, you know, and have that ability to just translate stuff, you know, on the fly. You know, at your location, um, and uh, it just just makes sense. So this is multi language chat. Yep. Well, it's like the Universal Translator from Star Trek. Yeah. Gene Roddenberry, folks. I, I, I you, you from know, one gene to another. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Two visionary men: one who wore makeup for a living, the other one who directed makeup for a living. I see this now. Yeah. You know, I I like this. I, I think that uh, natural search, uh, regardless of language. Um, yeah, it's funny because it's. It, it, do you see? Uh, maybe there is a time where language is is irrelevant, right? And we all are walking around with a box on yeah. around our our neck, saying, "Listen, this is the universal language is language. It's not. Uh, it's not English. It's not French. It's just a way to communicate." But I think that it was uh, certainly it was. Um, I think it was Schmidt who said that uh, this this uh, over the last week or so that that Siri poses the greatest threat to Google. Um, that they've ever faced at this point. And I think that that's one of these things because it's a natural search engine Siri right. is on the iPhone. And this is one of those things as well that when you when you when you take out the the thought of a different language and you actually just get down to its pure essence of communication, um, this is this is powerful. This is very, very, very oh, this, powerful. This is great. And, and so just, just to be clear, if, if you're going to go check this thing out, it's called Kowango from yeah. a company called Ortsbo. Uh, it's not officially available yet. It's, it's launching early uh, uh, in 2012. Uh, so it's in private beta right now. I'm sure there's, you know, if you're crafty, you can find a way to get into this beta thing. But they also said that they will be white labeling uh, this service into other, uh, uh, licensing it into other apps. So that's great because I think, you know, there's a lot of apps that could, could use a service like this. So, so yeah. you know, um, 
you know what Kawango needs? This is one of those things that, boy, I hope Kawango does this. I don't know if there's a camaraderie between all these uh, old rockers, Gene Simmons, but mm-hmm. I would love it if Kawango could translate what Ozzy Osbourne is saying. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Gene Simmons from from one rock star to another, it's like get this thing working on Ozzy Osbourne so we can finally understand what the guy's saying. There you go. All right. Well, you see, like you know, Gene's trying to get busy now. He's married. You know, he's got. He's you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he, he's he's got to find a reason to be out of the home now. <laughs> so he's, so he's, he's getting into the business. He's getting into the business. There you go. He's tired of licensing his tongue. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, those were the top five stories that we went through. They were long, and I'm not going to go through them right now because you have listened to them, and you can check out our new feature on the blog, actually. If you go to untethered.tv and you look up uh, This Week in Location-Based Marketing, it actually has the dates or the timestamp next to it. It tells you when you can actually jump to the stories that you want to do, so it makes it look a lot easier. So uh, go and do that. Those are the four, five stories. Now let's talk about this new feature, man. So for a long time, we have brought you a product of the week. And this is something that we think that is so unique in the industry or somebody's doing it right in the industry that we want to highlight this. We want to give them a little bit of plug, a little bit of push uh, and, and create a little bit of awareness for them. So we decided, listen, for the 52nd episode, our one year anniversary and going forward, why not bring those guys into the fold instead of us telling about the product and you guys listening to our voices why don't we sit down with the founders the ceos the entrepreneurs that are building those products and bring them into you so you can hear from their words you know and our questions what is going on with their product and guess what what do we do asif we made it happen so we went out and uh, did it yeah absolutely so our first our very first uh feature around product of the week uh, is with Neil Christ, who is the CEO of Venue Labs. And uh, we got to sit down with him uh, earlier on this week. And you are about to hear this interview right now. So enjoy it. And we'll be right back when this is done. Well, it's time for the product of the week. And as this is our uh, uh, one year uh, anniversary episode, we're changing things up this week and uh, we're bringing a, a guest on. And so, our first uh, ever guest on this uh, show, um, pleased to announce, is uh, Neil Christ. And Neil is the uh, founder and CEO of Venue Labs. Welcome, Neil. Hi, Steve. How are you? Thanks for having me. Uh, glad to have you. And so, just to kick things off, v- Venue Labs, Neil is a uh, location-based analytics company. You guys are based just outside of Seattle. Why don't you just uh, start by telling us, you know, who you are and uh, and what the company is all about? Yeah. So, Venue Labs was founded in 2009, uh, and we actually we've been uh, our primary market is we work with retailers uh, and essentially any consumer brand that has storefronts and. Um, and so we started out in sort of the location-based marketing uh, arena, and very quickly we realized that there was an opportunity to provide more analytics and measurements at the local level uh, for big brands. So we launched uh, a product called Connect, and Connect is a storefront intelligence offering that essentially brings together uh, all of the different location-based uh, data sources for brands and we provide analytics on top of that content so that brands really can understand what's going on at the storefront level. Okay. And and give us an example of some of the kinds of brands that uh, that you've been working with so so far. Yeah, so so we work with so uh, we have uh, a number of brands as customers today. Um, those those brands number from um, you know anywhere from 20 locations up to uh, over 10,000 locations. So I can give you some ideas of some customers yep. um, we interact with. So, um, you know, Snap Fitness is a is a brand um, that we've had for a while. Um, Ruby Tuesday, uh, Red Robin, Little Caesars. Um, so a number of a number of brands that uh, you know, very well known brands. Um, so we're really tackling some sort of fundamental uh, issues for them in the marketplace. Okay. And um, th- that's great. I mean, it sounds like you're working with some fantastic companies. The um, tell, tell me a little bit. As I was doing uh, some research and, and getting ready to, to chat with you today, you, you know, I noticed that uh, when you launched, you were uh, you were called Value Vine, and now you're you're uh, you've rebranded the company as Venue Labs. Can t- tell us why and, and kind of you know why it was important to make that change, and, and perhaps what the new focus is. Yeah. So I so I view that um, you know our name Venue Labs um, really sort of 
the rebrand really puts a capstone on uh, what we consider to be almost a year-long process of, of moving from a, uh, a promotions-focused uh, technology to more of an analytics platform. And so um, the, the previous name really spoke to sort of the promotional aspect, whereas Venue Labs really does in, uh, embody uh, some of our core values. And one of those is, you know, the fact that the venue, the location, uh, is the center of everything we do. Mm -hmm. you know, our goal is to bring all of the, the hyper-local insight we can uh, at the storefront level, at that venue level, uh, to big brands. Um, and then additionally, um, uh, the labs portion of our name really really speaks to the fact that, uh, you know, whether we're um, working uh, with, uh, you know, a brand like, um, you know, like Roto-Rooter or Jaguar or Ruby Tuesday, that um, we're always pushing the envelope in terms of what can be done, what can be learned, um, you know, both technically as well as how the product works. Um, because, you know, you know this well, that the, the market is ever-changing. Uh, the level of information available to brands is ever-changing, and so right. we're constantly pushing that envelope. So let's drill, let's drill down on that a little bit. I'm a brand. Uh, you know, I'm looking for insights into what's happening inside of my, my various locations, my venues. Um, Take me down to the very tactical level. You know what information is actually available to me if I, you know, sign on to work with with Venue Labs. You know, what, what can I learn? What can I get? Yeah, well, so that's a great question. So um, I, I should I should let you know that you know about uh, I'd say about two or three weeks ago we launched Venue Rank, and Venue Rank is a scoring mechanism, a scoring algorithm that we provide to brands, and we score their storefronts. Um, uh, on with a single score from one to hundred, that really gives them a single lens to understand the quality of the customer experience at the local level. And so, what this allows brands to do is not only to see that uh, to compare their stores on a regular basis, but also to um, to understand those stores relative to each other within a brand. Um, as well as um, we have uh, some brands using it for competitive reasons um, to understand. How does how do my stores stack up relative to the to the benchmark in the industry, or to the store down the street? Um, and so, my my reason in bringing that up is it kind of gets to to part of your question, which is, uh, you know, there's all of these data points out there, right? There's things like check-ins and tips and mm -hmm. comments and likes, follows and retweets, and there's all these data points that, you know, what brands have been asking us is what is the relative importance of all of these things. Um, how are we to to blend all this together and sort of have a unified understanding of of, of how our storefronts are doing uh, from those perspectives? So what we did is we took uh, Venue Rank is really um, it, it examines four different um, uh, dimensions. Uh, it examines reach, uh, engagement, uh, community, and then customer happiness. And all of the signals that we bring together. We're looking at and measuring and analyzing from those perspectives uh, to really give them that, you know, that score. So it's a combination of, you know, real data in terms of, you know, who's there, check-ins in terms of frequency, let's call it, or, or the numbers, as well as sentiment information around, you know, what do they think about it, the tips, the recommendations, the, you know, all that other stuff. Um, so Absolutely. And is, so it's one of the challenges that, that you face uh, in, in building a scoring system like that, you know, kind of ever increasing the number of feeds or data uh, sources that are coming into this or, you know, how do you manage that aspect of it or what are the data sources at the moment? Yeah, so, so there's definitely, so today and, and from a data source perspective, you know, um, I think the, the, the latest number I've seen is that there's probably 350 uh, or more different sources that uh, point to any particular business location. And so if you think about a brand with a thousand locations, that's a large, uh, a large footprint of data sources they need to worry about. Mm -hmm. I would say more practically for our brands, there's probably about 30 uh, for any given brand that they need to care about. Um, and so part of what we're able to do is, is identify the ones they should care about that have activity and bring those together um, so that they have sort of a a, a unified view now. Now, how does that change over time? I think what Venue Rank does is it really says uh, to a brand, it says, okay, um, if you're uh, a, a coffee shop chain, 
or, or a single coffee shop location, um, and your, your venue rank is 72. Well, the, the most important part of that score is, is the relative nature of it. So we can tell them which of those dimensions I talked about are strong or weak and, what, and which ones are trending you know, uh, better or worse over time. But we can also show them, here's, here's what a, a good coffee shop, a, a strong coffee shop, a, a coffee shop with a very strong and quality customer experience looks like. And it's a score of 97. Right. So, so if I'm hearing you correctly, there, there, there's really kind of three aspects in terms of how you can, if you're a brand, how, how you use this data. I mean, obviously understanding and getting insight into your own locations and the activity and the sentiment information around that, um, you know, as it pertains to, to the properties that you physically own. Uh, yep. un, you know, using this data to understand how you fit against, you know, competitors that are in your uh, proximity to, um, you know, where your locations are, let's say. Um, sure. And I guess a third would be, you know, kind of what you just alluded to, which is understanding better or broader, you know, the broader category that you might be in. So if you're in grocery, for example, and you've got, you know, all these locations, how are other uh, grocers, uh, you know, uh, working and, and, and reacting to location-based data, um, you know, relative to where you are? So not just competition, you know, in terms of physically, you know, I have a store at this intersection and there's a competing uh, coffee shop across the street. Uh, but you know, within the category at large, you know, looking at that data as well. That, that's true, and I, you know, I, the other point I'd make, in, in just in terms of looking at our brands and how they use uh, our platform today, I'd say the other key area that they use us for is really when you think about uh, how advertising dollars and marketing initiative dollars are really shifting to local. And I think we've seen some some numbers about about how quickly that's going to happen over the next couple of years. Brands really need to understand what's the local impact of. Uh, those initiatives. And so what we're able to do is, you know, both at that venue rank level as well as when they drill down into the components, they're able to look at how their initiatives are impacting their storefronts. And the the level of insight there I think is is fascinating in terms of, you know, we see geographical sensitivities to certain types of marketing. Um, and that, those feedback mechanisms I think are going to be really powerful for how brands optimize uh, their their marketing and advertising over time. Fantastic. Well, Neil, I think uh, you know that that's our time for today. I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show and sharing with us, uh, you know, the exciting things that are going on at Venue Labs. And we're certainly uh, proud to uh, have uh, Venue Labs as uh, as a member of the Location Based Marketing Association. So thanks for your time, and uh, you know, best of luck. Great. Thanks very much, Steve. And that was Neil Christ, CEO of <laughs> Venue Labs. Well, Steve, I mean. When, when you hear something like that and uh, you wrap your head around what these guys are doing, I, you know, I, it can only be told in his words. That's no, the way I feel. Absolutely. And I think it's it's so much more powerful to, you know, have the leaders or, you know, senior executives, visionaries from these companies tell tell their story in their own words. And so, you know, I think this is going to be a great, uh, you know, piece or addition to what we do every week. And, you know, and in particular, location-based analytics is something that's, you know, core to my uh, being and, 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 you know, a, a key piece of what I think is necessary in all of these products that we talk about. So, you know, a great place to start. So uh, thanks, Neil, for doing that. And, uh, you know, I guess now let's, let's move on to the funding. Well, I want to do a call out. So we've got Neil on there. And for those of you guys who are listening, where, whatever you're doing, whatever company yep. you are, why don't you reach out to us? And uh, and if you want to, if you want to actually sit down with a C for I, like we just did with Neil, it was a C that sat down with Neil. Um, we would love to have you on the show and highlight a product if it fits this location-based, mobile-based uh, uh, piece that we that we cover here. So reach out either at asif at the lbma.com or on tethergmail.com, and we'll we'll work around your schedule to get you onto the show if if uh, if we can do that. Reach out. We'd love to have you guys on the show and help you promote what you're doing uh, in this space. It's very important that we do that, right? Absolutely. All right. So if you want to be uh, if you want to be on the show, we're going to do this every week when we have a, a relevant uh, a relevant company. So we'd love to hear from you. Now let's jump into the funding. Yeah, no guests here. Let's do it. And uh, we got three stories to cover. So all right. So the first one, typical. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a raise. Meridian raises a million dollars. Is there anything yeah, to talk about there? Interesting. I mean, yeah, I mean, not a lot to say about it. The company is uh, called Meridian, a uh, company that's been around for a while. They're out of Portland, Oregon, um, and they raised a million a million dollars, a seed a seed fund, uh, seed round from Oregon Angel Funds and Bellingham uh, Angels, which are both in the uh, in the Oregon area, I assume. Um, 
you know, I don't know a lot about this company. It's a company that um, has been around for quite a while, like uh, like more than 10 years from what I can tell, um, doing location-based mobile uh, development. And um, they've been also very closely aligned with Cisco from what I can tell uh, in, in from a hardware perspective. So this is a company that apparently, you know, gets mobile uh, software development, uh, you know, connections to hardware. Um, from a couple of the examples I read, you know, they're involved in uh, indoor location, obviously we're using Cisco Wi-Fi gear and other gear um, and connecting that to mobile apps. So, you know, not a lot to say about it other than, hey, you know, raised a million bucks and they're going to pump that into uh, further uh, their mobile development piece and, you know, good on them. Good and uh, yeah, Meridian. Meridian raises a million dollars. She seems like such a small amount compared to the next story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just just a little, just a, tiny. And and obviously the next story is uh, the big IPO that is is a is about to happen. Yelp has filed for their IPO, their hundred million dollar IPO, which I think is probably conservative. I hope I think that they were probably they were wanted to do a little bit more than a hundred million. Well, it's nowhere near the billions of of uh, you know our, our good friends at Groupon, but no. Um, yeah, uh, this is interesting. I mean, I you know I, I don't know whether or not this is just you know everybody's doing IPOs, so let's do one too. Um, you know, LinkedIn did like, did theirs, Groupon did theirs, uh, Facebook's you know apparently getting ready to do, do theirs. Um, so we got to get out there. Um, I don't know. I mean, personally, you and I have talked a lot about you know public versus private companies. Uh, I'm you know you know the extra reporting and and scrutiny that comes with being a public company. You know, when you've been private for so long, uh, you gotta you gotta weigh that. So, you know, I, I'm not gonna uh, venture an opinion on that one. But this is a company that's been there for a long time. Uh, they've been doing some good stuff. Um, they uh, apparently did uh, 22 million in revenue in Q3 of this year, uh, which is up from uh, 12.6 uh, million at this time last year. So that's that's like double almost. Yeah. Uh, you know, the the revenue that they did in, in third quarter last year, which is is significant. So. These guys are, are, you know, are making money, um, you know, so they're uh, they're cranking it up there, um, and, and they got lots of visitors too. Apparently, they had 61 million monthly unique visitors uh, at the end of the third quarter. Um, you know, some so the numbers are significant. What are your thoughts, Rob? Well, I, I think that the, uh, I, yeah, I always weigh the, the consideration of 100 million dollars, and and it, this is this is not a lot of money to raise. I mean, it's a ton. I mean, Asif and I are only looking for a million. Right for this week in location-based yeah. marketing, so a uh, hundred million dollars. Um, so part of me says, look, you know, it's a very competitive world. Yelp is uh, is kind of uh, is now fa- fighting this battle with uh, Foursquare because Foursquare has moved into their space a little bit, yeah. and they've got Groupon on the other side, and they got all these other competitors. And we mentioned a couple of them in Yowza, in uh, Scavenger, yeah. Yeah. and Google's definitely there on recommendations and other things too. So. Yeah, so so I think that they they have to do something, and they have to be a little bit aggressive in what what they're going to do, and and I think that they have to instill a little bit of confidence. And you know, there's an evolution of confidence that a company goes through. It's about closing big deals, it's big chains, uh, getting venture round, staying in business for three years, um, and then that next hurdle is is an IPO. Uh, but the IPO, what it does do, as we talked about many times before, is that it opens up the kimono. It just says. You are now an open book, so your competitors can look at your P and L. They can look at everything, where you're spending your money, what you bought. You know, it, it's amazing what you can find out in a disclosed financial statement. So, um, uh, you know, I think that they have to do something. Yelp has to do something. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think that they're failing, um, but I think that it, to remain competitive, a hundred million dollars is a hundred million dollars, and and this allows them to expand. Uh, but it is a very competitive space out there. Uh, would I put yeah. my money into into Yelp? Ah. I, no, I, I don't think that I would I would uh, I would put my money into Yelp unless I had founder shares and I was getting out very quickly. Yeah, and they do have some interesting guys that are part of the uh, the current investor mix. I mean, they've got you know uh, the CEO owns like eleven percent of the company. Yeah. And I was looking at uh, some of their other holdings and and um, what's the guy's name? Uh, Max uh, Levchin, uh, who's one of the founders of uh, PayPal. He owns like almost fourteen percent of Yelp, so um, you know that's pretty interesting as well. Could there possibly be some connections between PayPal and Yelp in the future? Uh, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, if you start yeah. to think about, uh, I mean, eBay and uh, and Yelp, maybe that's a yeah. big marriage. Yeah, we all know what's what's going to happen in the space. Uh, you know, it's it's going down this path where the big companies 
were a little bit slow to get into this. And we talked about this over the last 52 episodes. The big companies were a little bit slow to get moving in, into this. And these upstarts like Foursquare and Gowalla and all those guys we talked about in episode one um, yeah. that we, we don't often talk about now because the big companies have now stepped it up and moved into this space. So I look at all of these guys, independent companies, and I think, you know, is there a future for a lot of these companies that they found a great little niche um, or and they can survive or they have found a broad uh, reach like Yelp and now they're becoming too much of a nuisance for a guy like you know, for a company like Google or right. eBay where it's just like you know we have to buy those guys to put them down so that we can actually dominate yeah. you know and, and the plus side obviously to public company is is that from the perspective of acquiring other companies yeah. um, you know it does create you know easier liquidity for you know anybody coming in or anybody who wants out right yeah. because it's public you can sell your shares you can buy shares I mean yeah. Um, you, 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 know, can, so, you can use it for leveraged acquisitions because it's, yeah. it's paper, not money, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I'm not saying there's there's, there's no pluses to this. So, um, yeah, it you know, protects them probably. But if you're like, even if you know, there's talk right now of BlackBerry of Rim, you know, their share price is so low that their combined value of the share price is lower than their actual asset value. Yeah. So everybody looks at this and says, okay, well, this is an opportune time, even if it's a public company, for somebody to do a, a you know a, a takeover of this company. And and that's another risk that you have. But uh, you know what? Yelp has to do what Yelp has to do. Google did it, and it turned out well for them. <laughs> yep. So. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. Well, Yelp. We'll see what happens with the. Uh, do we? Was there any uh, indication of when it's actually going to file? Was it this coming? No, I didn't, I didn't see a date on it. Yeah. All right. Anybody out there knows? Let, let us know, please. We'd love to know. The last thing, uh, the last story uh, is an acquisition by Apple. And I think this is very significant. Uh, you know, I, I think it, got, it came out under the radar, but uh, this is very significant just because of who it is, not the company, but who it's up against. Yeah, yeah. So Apple, Apple bought a company called C3 Technologies, which is a company that uh, specializes in 3D mapping. Um, and this isn't a company that, you know, just kind of fell off, you know, the uh, end of the table and said, you know, we're going to do 3D mapping. This is a company that basically um, acquired um, technology from the, uh, the military uh, that was, had developed mapping uh, technology for the U.S. military and, uh, you know, have been deploying it. Um, in a way that lets you basically visually see with many layers, you know, 3D maps of uh, both indoor and outdoor uh, mapping of, of locations. So this is huge because when you think about location-based services and, and the marketing capabilities, uh, you know, of, you know, married up against, you know, uh, some of the apps and, and services that we see in, in the world today, whether it's Foursquare or Apple's uh, technology itself, I think having this is, is really interesting. And I think the key here for Apple is is we're seeing – you know, moves little by little by Apple, uh, either through acquisition or through their own uh, development, to make themselves less reliant on Google Maps and Google Earth and and you know Google Street View and all this other stuff. And and you know, it's not going to be long before they can just basically map everything on their own. Is how I see this kind of playing out. Um, yep. And so this is a great move by Apple. Um, and I think it's really interesting. And, and I was when I was reading this press release further, they gave an example, and, and I'm going to read this example just so I, I don't miss the essence of it. But it basically says, consider a group of friends after an event wanting to go out somewhere to eat. They fire up Living Social or Groupon or, you know, they use Living Social as an example here uh, and uh, to get recommendations on where to go. And they're presented with a number of discounts for venues within their locality. Two restaurants look good. But instead of going to the website in the hope that they have a gallery of photos so that you can see what the restaurants look like, instead Living Social extends to include a full internal view of the restaurant providing a glimpse of the dining experience. And that's what the C3 te technology can do. Basically, it can give you a full 3D immersed uh, you know, visual both outside and inside of, of a place and show you what it looks like. Uh, and you can experience it just right then and there. It, it's uh, it's phenomenal, you know. Potentially where this can go. I'm not, I'm not saying that exists today. That integration with Living Social, but that's that's the kind of power what they're talking about of of how this stuff fits together. Well, I, I see it, and, and there are two things that I think that are so significant about this deal. If it's if it comes to fruition, where c 3s technology is actually integrated in iOS, is that the first one is advertisement dollars. Mm -hmm. This is the biggest thing: is that relying on Google to drive, uh, relying on Google to provide the the maps so that uh, they can actually benefit as a result of all the advertisements, pop-ups, all those kind of things. Not in Apple's best interest, because the second reason is 
Apple has iAds and they want to own that entire experience. They want to be able to create the value. They want to create an ad network the same way that Google's done and they don't want to drive, you know, the, the uh, contribute to their high, biggest competitor, which is Android, their success. So I think that this is a good move. And the third thing, quite frankly, is the fact that Google and why would they do Google is now charging for uh, uh, access to the uh, Google Maps API at a certain level, high level. And this could be very, very, very costly for Apple. So to buy this company and integrate it and move away from Google Google Maps, obviously this is this is what they're going to do at some point. I don't know if it's going to be iOS five, my uh, or or uh, the uh, new iPhone five that you know in a year from now, but uh, perhaps iOS six integration. Who knows? But it just seems yeah. logical for me. Those three reasons. Yeah, and the other thing, just just while we're on the topic of Apple, before we leave this and and move on, uh, the other thing that uh, Apple announced this week is uh, the uh, they were awarded a patent uh, in location based services, and it's actually a patent that uh, they didn't apply for themselves. It's a patent that they acquired. Uh, from Xerox um, some time ago, and uh, it was reissued this week, you know, to Apple um, because it was originally issued to, to Xerox. And I'm going to read this patent because this is huge um, as, as well. So this is uh, uh, the patent reads as follows: a, a location information service uses a positioning system such as the Civilian Navstar Global or GPS in combination with a distributed network. Uh, the location information system goes on, and, and basically, you know, it goes on and on to basically outline uh, what this thing is. And the claim is a location information system that displays location-specific information and uh, comprising of a receiver that receives the location identification from at least one site-specific object identifying a location, and a transceiver that transmits the location back. So the bottom line is, is these guys have now been awarded the most broad location-based patent that I think you could possibly get. What does that mean? I mean, like for Foursquare and Facebook and Samsung and HTC and all these guys, I, I don't know, because this is a patent that's way back from 2000. Well, yeah. <laughs> I think it's, that... It's uh, crazy. It's as, crazy. Well, as, uh, Tom, as Tom Merritt and uh, everybody at uh, uh, Tech News Today talk about it, it's the patent wars, and I wish we had our own theme title yeah. like they do, but this is uh, this is going to get a whole lot uglier before it gets uh, gets settled, right? Certainly, and, and Apple, you know, you know, will probably sit on this for a while, and uh, you know, it, it's like a lot of good companies that get patents. You know, you you pull out the big guns when you need to, right? Wow, Apple, and, uh, Apple tends uh, you know, to shoot. It's, shoot it's very always quickly. it's always a good strategy to let your competitors blow a pile of money on developing stuff, and then you know, uh, and then hit them. Wow, uh, yeah. Stifling, stifling innovation, but that's another story we're going to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Anyways, we'll leave that alone. But anyways, I, all, all just to say, Apple's been very, very busy. Yes, and they've been sl slowly doing these things. Uh, yeah. Meridian raises a million dollars. Yelp files for a hundred million dollar IPO. Uh, Apple acquires C3 Technologies for 3D mapping, and obviously are awarded a pretty substantial patent in this past week as well. What a week! What a week! So we'll just finish off very quickly with a resource of the week, which is um, all about virtual goods and mobile gaming uh, and how the revenue from those are growing at a breathtaking, and I use that in quotes, breathtaking pace. Yeah, so this, uh, we'll put the link up. It's uh, coming from, again, from eMarketer. These guys are great for uh, yep. for finding this stuff. Um, and the data itself that they're looking at uh, comes from Juniper Research. Uh, and it basically looks at uh, kind of this, this growth of virtual goods purchased uh, through mobile. And uh, in 2011, uh, this year, that's uh, that's three million or three billion bucks, um, and uh, they expect it to be at 4.6 uh, billion. So this this is growing uh, pretty significantly, and uh, you know it, it's interesting. And, and I actually spoke with a guy this week um, who uh, has a, a platform, uh, a backend uh, platform that they license to mobile game developers. Uh, so they've been working with Red Robot, who we've talked about before on the show, and, and others. Um, and the interesting part of the conversation was is we talked about, you know, how do you actually make money in mobile or location-based gaming? And obviously advertising is one model around that and virtual goods, uh, you know, is, is another way to do that. But the percentage of people he was saying that actually purchase virtual goods uh, versus those that just play the free versions of the games, you know, it's, it's, it's such a small number. It's like, you know, less than 2% yeah. uh, of the total users. But they've uh, they've they've started to find a new revenue model, which is you know actually bringing physical locations into the mix. So what they're doing is is they're signing deals with merchants, with retailers, 
uh, or and, and brands, for example, like Starbucks. Um, and so what they'll do is, is they'll say, you know, okay, you're playing this game, and if you want to get certain virtual goods or, or items or powers or whatever it is that's in this game, you can get them, and uh, and you don't have to pay for them. Um, they, they've been paid for for you by a brand, but you have to go to this physical location, this Starbucks, to actually get it. Um, and, and that's you know an interesting model that's starting to emerge in this space. So you know, and so now we're seeing real locations, physical locations, come into this concept of mobile gaming. And so now we're getting you know true location-based gaming. Yeah, and I think that that's something. You know, I'm not as as uh, impressed by these numbers because they're talking about three billion in this year to four point six billion by 2016. Yeah, that really isn't growth for me in a space that's going. You know, actually, it's concave the growth that we're seeing right now in the mobile space. And uh, so going from three to four point six, ho hum. And my guess is a lot of this revenue is around. They say because this is around mobile, social media, networking, dating, and virtual goods, two thousand eleven to, uh, to yeah. twenty sixteen. So my guess is this is a lot of uh, credit buying on the uh, on the dating apps, right? Um, it could be. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, they don't break it out though. So. No, they don't because it would. I think it would be um, um, quite telling where people spend their money. And I'm pretty sure that if, if somebody figured out how to uh, to charge effectively for mobile porn, uh, th that number would accelerate a whole lot faster. That's just because it, it's a it's a leading indicator, and uh, those guys uh, typically are uh, driving good revenue yeah. in in relation to this. And, and it's, so I think that th these numbers, well, um, you know, it, it, these wouldn't entice. Well, me it, at least it's not shrinking, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> it is not shrinking. Yeah, but it's not growing at a rate that we think that yeah. I, that I think should be growing at. So, you know, I, again, it's it's they're not great numbers, but I think that uh, I think as people, you know, we've gone through that transition that said, you know, five years ago, who in their right mind would buy something a virtual good? Now to this year, to actually driving enough revenue to make it an industry, and then right. by 2016, I think that this number is very low because how can you predict that the next five years? Come on, something's going to happen. You know that uh, that's going to change the way that we use these devices, or virtual goods are going to become relevant, like a currency or something like that, and it's going to blow this number out of the out of the ballpark. So, but this is eMarketer, uh, and and uh, they do this uh, um, through Juniper Juniper Research, and we'll include the link right up there. There you go. And if you're not watching this right now, and if you're not where that link is, well, I can't help you. Just and, do a and, search and for virtual goods. Stand, and you've been watching forever, um, you know, have a cupcake. Have us. a cupcake on yeah. us. That's right. So That's it. Too. So uh, I want to thank uh, each and every one of you guys who are listening or watching right now for coming along with us for these first 52 episodes, this first year that we've done it. It's been a blast doing with Asif, and I can't I can't wait to, uh, to start next week on our second year, which is unbelievable to think about, and drive our way to our next monument, which I think is probably going to be our... Well, well, we'll celebrate at 75, but definitely 100, 100 episodes, so 48 yeah. to go. It's been a great, it's been a great 52, Asif. I really, it's I'm really awesome. glad that we got and, to do this. Uh, I thank you, Rob, for uh, for for being here and uh, doing this with me, and uh, I thank all of our fans and and everybody who's out there watching. Uh, we appreciate it, and I just got a tweet from uh, from one of them, so uh, you know that that's uh, that's fantastic. So, uh, uh, Aaron. Uh, who just tweeted us? He's a CEO of a company called uh, Taza, which is actually in India, um, nice. a location-based company in India. So, um, thanks for that. We really appreciate it, and uh, we appreciate Neil Christ for being the guinea pig uh, for our new segment. And again, if you have anything that you want to contribute to us, let us know on tethergmail.com or asif at thelbma.com. Follow Asif at asifarcon on Twitter or at the lbma on Twitter, or myself at Rob Woodbridge on Twitter. And uh, we can't wait to bring you our second year of this podcast. We really appreciate you guys watching. Wherever you are, thank you so much. It means a lot to us. Asif, we'll see you for episode number 53 next week. Thanks, bud. See you later, everybody.